Can you see my uh, slides, Amber? We sure can. Okay, I'm gonna do a tag team with myself and Chase. All right. Um, so we're both here in the room together. Great. All right. We'll give it. So let right. me know when you're ready and we'll start. We're ready. Let me introduce you right quick and then the floor will be yours. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, using a forest, using a forest to explore the logs, automation, analytics and AI with Zeke Logs at UC Davis. Today we have Jeff Rowe and one of his uh, uh, co-workers that will be presenting today. Um, Jeff, can you tell folks a little bit about um, who you are, what you do and what they can expect from today's talk? Uh, yeah, in fact, I can even start the talk, which will explain a little bit of that. So um, I, I work for security operations at UC Davis. UC Davis is, if you work at, ever worked at a university, you'll know that, you know, when people talk about enterprise security, it doesn't always cover UC, a, a university environment. You know, we have a huge, large number of servers, clients, tons of users. We have a mini hospital. We have PCI credit card merchants. We have everything. People live on campus. You know, so typical enterprise will block things like Netflix and you can't play Xbox games. Well, we can't do that. So we have this really open environment. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And um, we have not decent, we have decentralized, you know, IT governance. And so, um, you know, we don't always get to tell people what to do. And, and that's, that's always a big challenge. So, you know, we basically allow everything across the border, more or less. And, um, you know, that's what, we have, that's what we have to deal with. So our job here is to, you know, to manage the security of all this. And, you know, that's no joke. So the, the brief overview of the security operations at UC Davis. Um, you know, we have a, a variety of domains. You can, you can organize this however you want, but, you know, this is how we've chosen to do it. And I think that, um, you know, core light is, is how we get the Zeek logs. And it sort of forms the core for a lot of our sort of operational um, workflows, because what we really want to do is take the core light logs, use those to correlate via the vulnerability scanner with application security and kind of traverse around this, you know, um, set of uh, technologies in our portfolio to put together the bigger picture of what's going on. So all these systems we have generate events, you know, logs. Uh, we get about 20,000 um, events per second, and that's always growing. And so all the work that we do is, you know, is all about managing this giant information flow. Um, how we, our, the core of our uh, event management uh, system is uh, the unification of all these streams in our Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, and you can see CoreLite, you know, is probably is one of our biggest producers of events. And this elastic cluster gives us, you know, we, we collect 800 gigabytes up to a terabyte of day of data. And so this forms the basis for, uh, you know, a nice analytics platform. We can use all the data in the elastic cluster. We can use the elastic API to do all kinds of analytical tasks. And so, you know, what does this look like? We get, uh, you know, 150 million events in our core light logs a day probably maybe even small for some universities, I don't know. Um, so we, that's a lot of data you know, to analyze. How do you make sense of it? Um, we get a lot of alerts in 24 hours. I think you know, our Intel feed from, from CoreLite, the Zeke logs are about a million a day. And uh, when we all went home for COVID that bumped up to 700, 7 million a day. And you know, that was a little bit disturbing. I think everybody, uh, Everybody in the world was looking for a remote access computer. People went home and then turned on RDP and forgot about it. And everybody in the world was searching for those. Uh, the notice logs are three, you know, about 3,000 a day. And then our other IDS systems give us 15, 20,000 alerts a day. So how is a, hand, you know, a handful of guys is not going to go through this many alerts and figure out what's going on manually? So we need to automate all this. Oops, I went the wrong way. So our, our main focus in the last couple of years has been automation. Um, in my previous life, I worked with a great guy at the uh, Indiana University in cognitive science department, Bennett Burton Tall. And he's, his, his point was, 
know, if you look at chess and they, they have these matches, AI against the human, sometimes AI wins, these days AI always wins, but in those days, AI sometimes wins and, and sometimes a grandmaster wins. But what doesn't really get uh, talked about much is that an AI assisted person can actually defeat both of them. So how can we, how can we use AI as an assistant versus AI as a, you know, the perfect robot that's always going to give us the right answer. And I think that's the problem that we're really looking to, to address. Um, so, you know, we, we worked in the same uh, world for a long time. You know, it sucked. I hated, everybody hated it. So we, you know, decided, well, let's just try to do automation everywhere. And, you know, we'll use the APIs instead of portals and dashboards and all that. What do we have 20 dashboards? You know, we're not going to, I'm not going to log in and look at those every day. So we just look at the API. Do scripting versus building, you know, standalone software engineering, you know, software engineered portals and platforms and things like that. And then, and then what I'm talking, what we're going to talk about here is using the AI to, to do us, you know, to assist us in our operations. And so the, the baby version that I came up with, because I'm not an AI expert, initially was, well, you take the, the this relatively small alert stream from, from Corelight, um, you know, they're basically Zeke logs, and each, for each alert, you bracket and use the features in the alert to pick out automatically through, through the API every day, all the events in the Corelight logs that are going to be relevant, and then you kind of package that as an investigation, use some filtering to get rid of the stuff that you don't want. And, and you know, that works pretty good. At least you have everything in one place, but it doesn't really you know, do enough of a reduction in the volume for us for it to be useful to us. So you know, we want to take that to the next level. And so I'm going to turn this over to Chase, and he will talk about uh, the sort of breaking hot off the presses news of the analytics and AI that we're working on at UC Davis to try to handle these, you know, the alert investigations. OK, uh, hey, everybody. So. I'm going to be talking about some of the higher level analytics and AI we've been doing. Okay, so our first goal was to just kind of start out, uh, get a feel for what's normal and what's unusual when we're looking at outgoing data flows from UC Davis. So the sort of question we want to ask here is, how can we identify irregular or anomalous data flows uh, and what constitutes unusual at our campus? So in order to do that, we deployed this isolation forest model. Uh, so at a high level, the isolation forest is an unsupervised ensemble tree-based anomaly detection algorithm. Uh, and it's based on random partitions of the sample space. So what that means for us is, um, sorry, as a, as a tree-based algorithm, the isolation forest lends itself really well to our problem because we have a lot of categorical data, like, for example, the country or the ISP uh, that external users are connecting from. So... Um, just a quick explanation. Basically, with this algorithm, we're playing an extended game of 20 questions, right? So we randomly partition the sample space based on the data we see. Uh, and if we assume that, you know, normal connections or normal data points are sort of more tightly clustered in the sample space than high outliers, then we can expect to isolate outliers uh, more quickly or with fewer sort of partitions or questions. So as an example of this, let's say I was thinking randomly of one of the cars in this parking lot. So if I was thinking of the car, you know, up here, this white sort of Toyota, how many questions would you need to ask before you knew that was the car I'm talking about? Like, for example, it's white, it's a Toyota, it has four doors. And even then, there's probably still a lot of other white four-door Toyotas in this parking lot. Uh, so you would probably still need to keep asking questions to narrow it down versus this car on the bottom, right? It has blue flames, it has a chrome fender. So in just one or two questions, you can immediately figure out that this very unusual car is the one I'm thinking of. So, that's the basic principle behind the isolation forest. Uh, so in terms of results, this is basically what it looks like. So each one of these rows is gonna be an individual connection in the core light logs, right? Um, and on the far right here, we have the sort of assigned anomaly score from the algorithm. So for example, if we look at this first one, we can see uh, we have a hundred standard deviations above average in terms of the number of bytes sent back. So that's a huge amount, definitely anomalous. But if we look at the org, it's sent to the Mayo Clinic. So um, while it is unusual, it's not necessarily something to be worried about, right? You, you, the university sending a lot of data to the Mayo Clinic isn't necessarily something that's going to be harmful versus the second row here where we have 30 standard deviations above average, still a ton of data, uh, in this case being sent to Saudi Arabia. So in that case, you know, maybe this is something we want to be worried about. So you can kind of see how the results from this algorithm kind of lend themselves to a investigate human-assisted investigation where we can sort of 
cut down this like raw data log into something more manageable that we can we can look at individually. So um, also, if we look at the big picture here, this is the top 1.5% of data flows outbound from UC Davis. Um, so the other thing this algorithm enables us to do is sort of get a sense for what the landscape is, right? Um, we can categorize problematic devices on campus and just kind of get a feel for what type of data is going out and what type of devices are sending that data out. Um, so yeah, this is some more about filtering out. So basically we can categorize devices on campus uh, under three major categories with regards to unusual data. So the first one is large uh, anomalous encrypted data flow. So this is, these are devices that show up in our anomaly logs just based on the fact that they're sending out a huge amount of data. So this might be bad, it might be good. We have to look at those individually to determine. Um, we also have malware magnets. So basically these are devices that people on campus have set up and kind of forgot about. Think like maybe a server running in somebody's closet or a lab computer that was set up to run some service years ago uh, that the professor just forgot about. So they don't do anything legitimate. Um, and all they really do is kind of just pick up bad stuff from external actors scanning our whole range. Um, so those are definitely something we learned about with the algorithm. And finally, we have UC Davis assets you wish you own. So these are sort of high value devices on campus and they might have tight security most of the time, but um, to external actors, they just look like a giant Bitcoin mine. Uh, so those are definitely uh, priority targets and we see a lot of unusual behavior or attacks uh, targeting those devices as well. So uh, in terms of actionable sort of results from this, um, we have uh, new events that we can investigate and we can cut it down to a manageable load using human assistance. Uh, we've also detected four compromised remote access RDP servers in the past month alone. Um, and we're also doing other things to make sure the risks are mitigated from the various device categories we've created since starting this algorithm. Okay, so that's all very nice, but as we just saw, anomalous doesn't necessarily mean bad. So there's a lot of unusual things going on. For example, like the thing we saw with the Mayo Clinic where it's, it's unusual, but not necessarily harmful. So our other goal is to determine what is, un, or what is actually dangerous. In other words, like how can we identify UC Davis specific threats uh, that are missed by general threat intel, but we know are definitely bad. So in this case, we wanna take a different approach where we build a random forest model from existing threat data that's gonna learn relevant indicators and accurately identify attacks in real time. So at a high level, the random forest is kind of related to the isolation forest, except that it's supervised. So it's a supervised ensemble tree-based classifier based on maximizing homogeneity in a target variable. Uh, so what that means for us is, uh, I guess my, Oh, here it is. So uh, the again, like similar to the isolation forest, this algorithm handles our data well because it's tree-based. Uh, so we can handle a lot of our categorical variables well. And for classification, we have the added bonus that it's really interpretable. So we know why it's making the decisions it's making, and we can look at indicators in the data set and figure out which ones are most predictive of an attack. So uh, in terms of how we do this, basically we get all of these external uh, sources give us these threat IOCs, which we match to events in the Corelight conlog to see you know, if we were actually under attack by, for example, these identified uh, malicious IPs. So once we cross-reference those, we can pull all of these events from our raw Corelight log uh, and feed that directly into the training data for the machine learning model. So uh, at that point, the model will learn which indicators uh, and which values for the various features are relevant to predicting whether an event is an attack or something that's completely benign. Um, and so in terms of performance uh, on our testing data, which is pulled right from our core light logs, uh, we have definitely what would be considered state-of-the-art performance. Um, and the most important feature here is that we have near perfect precision in separating the good from the bad. So you can see here, um, you know, we can't always tell with perfect certainty what type of attack we're seeing, but we can definitely tell we have almost perfect precision and recall metrics when it comes to separating attacks from benign events. Um, and then as a final validation, in July 2021, we preemptively identified 11 custom IOCs uh, related to Russian APT activity two weeks before we were warned by the FBI. So uh, before receiving this warning, we had already sort of identified these external threats in our feed. Okay, so uh, lastly, we've also developed this sort of neural net investigation assistant. So existing methods, oh, sorry. 
Uh, existing methods provide us with a way to identify potentially compromised devices, but finding a specific point in time where an intrusion happened isn't always straightforward, right? So for example, someone comes to us and tells us their computer is doing something strange on the network, or they think they might've been compromised, but they're not sure. Um, so, you know, we're not even sure at that point if a device has been compromised, much less, you know, when the compromise happened or like where in the feed that can be found. So in order to assist us with this, uh, we've developed this long-term, long short-term memory or LSTM neural network architecture to pick out these sort of unusual anomalous events out of the network feed. Uh, so the goal here is to kind of learn what the normal behavior for a device looks like. So then we can figure out where the abnormal thing happened. So uh, what that means for us basically is that this sort of architecture preserves context as it sequentially crawls across the device's activities over time. And it also provides us with the power necessary to identify anomalous events. So um, the specifics of this can get pretty complicated, but I guess the primary takeaway is that this sort of model maintains a learned internal state uh, in addition to the raw inputs. So it kind of like tracks the context. Right. Uh, and we also, in our specific architecture, we have a central autoencoder layer, which kind of represents all the data about the, or the raw data and this, the context in a reduced feature space. So then we rebuild from that compressed data uh, and then predict the next five events in the stream. So each sort of step looks like we look at 10 events in the stream uh, and we try to predict the next five. So maybe, you know, we're seeing a bunch of small connections to an Amazon data center. Well, we might be about to see a big update downloaded from that same data center. That would be nothing to be worried about. Versus we're seeing normal day-to-day -day connections to people working from home. And then suddenly a huge amount of data goes out to Russia. So, so in that case, that would be something to be worried about. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, the training definitely fits well. And once we identify anomalous events in the stream, we can sort of look at the specific features, uh, for example, like IPs, um, packet counts, all that, and match it to other events in the stream to complete and advance our investigation. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeff for the final remarks. So this is all kind of new work for us, um, but it's been extremely valuable at the very beginning. I think that it, um, you know, we're really excited about the results we got back from our, uh, our specific um, UC Davis specific threat intel. You know, that, that, you know, instead of having these, you know, million threat uh, alerts per day, we can focus on the ones that are specific to UC Davis. You know, we learn new Intel, we, we learn new IOCs from that also. So that, that's, a big, that's a big boost, you know, it reduces the amount of work that we have to do. And then the, uh, the neural net sort of investigation package, which, which really gives us, you know, the relevant events versus all the events it is also a big help. So these things are, you know, this is all work in progress. We continue to, 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 to try to develop and refine these, um, but uh, I think it fits in really nicely with our overall uh, sort of orchestration and automation efforts that we do at UC Davis. So we are past our 15 minutes. And uh, if, uh, if there's any questions, then maybe I can have Amber feed those to me because I don't have the uh, chat available to me here. Uh, if, <laughs> otherwise, uh, just to say that, um, you know, if you have any other questions, feel free to send me an email at the, at the email address at the bottom. Jeff, thank you so much. I am taking a look now. Uh, let me see. Um, I don't see a particular question, but uh, Seth uh, Grover says, open distro for Elastix transitioning to open, sur or open search. Anomaly detection plugin uses a very similar technique, random cut for us, that we've had very good luck with and plugged into Elastic Kibana as well. So he was just a, a comment for you. And Ricky Lynn says, this is really amazing. I'll probably have to rewatch the recording a dozen times to understand a few uh, percentage. Regarding supervised timing, you, are you constantly needing to classify daily? Are there also are there are there good starting resources and resources and maybe a simpler scenarios like just taking the origin and um, respite bytes. So um, and, and then uh, Greg Bell asked, will any of this work be open source? So you do have a few uh, questions in the channel. 
Well, so let me just, uh, you know, uh, regarding Seth's comment, I think that's really, it, it's really valuable to have these things built in and automatically, you know, generating, you know, events for people. I think the challenge for us is we want to move beyond the, you know, detection and, to, and have it be more of a, you know, how can we assist ourselves in dealing with the, with the large number of events that we already have? Um, and, and, you know, there's a huge gray area between those two things. So, you know, you could use one or the other. So for now, we're actually not doing real time uh, generation of anything. What we're doing is daily, every day we run a job that looks over yesterday's uh, Zeke logs, basically. That's what we're doing now. Um, the second comment was, I forgot exactly. Oh, I think maybe that was the question of how, how we often we do this. Uh, yeah, we do this every day. And, and the neural network classif classifier is done on demand. So if we have an, an investigation we're conducting, we run that on, you know, using the, the uh, source and destination IP of the devices in question. And then it generates a bunch of, uh, you know, it, it identifies the core, the uh, con log and core light log entries that we want to take a look at that are relevant to us. And, and everything else you know, is sort of uh, filtered out. And then the third, remind me the third one, uh, Amber, sorry. Uh, will it be open sourced? It, man, you know, in my fantasy world, <laughs> we'd have a nice open source clean package that we would distribute to everybody. But uh, for, so far it is, you know, quick and dirty sort of um, stuff that we've thrown together. Uh, we would like to open source it. Yes, we would like to do that. I, I, but you know, I'm hesitant to promise that to anybody. Well, you, you just let us know on the Zeke set how we can help you open source that. So it's, it's a little bit odd because it's not technically something you would put in Zeke. It's more of a something you would add on later to do investigation based on the Zeke logs that you already have. Oh, just on that, even if it's standalone, if there's something that we, we can help you. Uh... Yeah, okay. I mean, there is an advantage to it being standalone. And I, I will mention that it's fairly general. So the, you know, the, the code that we use to identify large encrypted data, flow, uh, data flows crossing our border, we developed that for the SS, SSL stream, but it works just as well with unmodified on the RDP and the SSH data. Same thing. It's just, the, it's the core light con log, basically. Cool. Um, we did have one other question, which was, what is the false positive rate? Well, see, we technically we have zero false positive because we're not having we're not generating any alerts. Right. We're we're producing packages that help us understand our data. So so we've uh, we've deliberately avoided. Trying to have this be an intrusion detection system with false positives and false negatives. That's a terrible answer, I know, but but, but that's been our goal. So with, with that, we are now uh, past the, the time for your talk. And I want to say thank you to you both um, for giving this talk. We've got a, if you get a chance to join the Slack channel, um, you can interact with, with folks over there. Um, and we do have a break coming up. Jeff, if you and Chase want to stay on and chat a little bit, like I did with Fatima, you're more than welcome to. Uh, we'll, we have a break until, uh, what, until about 22. So, um, if everybody wants to, you know, go grab coffee, do a bio break. In the meantime, Jeff, if you guys want to stay on camera, we'll just chat a little while until it's time for James's talk um, at 22, if you'd like to do that. Yeah, sure. So, Actually, can I, sorry. Go ahead. Can I talk about the false positive rate thing real quick? Yes, you can. Well, Please do. Yeah, in terms of false positive, it's one thing to talk about the, like, as an intrusion detection system, but also uh, in terms of labeling events. Uh, first of all, for the unsupervised stuff, there's not necessarily a false positive rate because we're not trying to predict any labels, right? So like there's no real way to detect a rate for anomalies, right? There's just a list of unusual events. So, but there is a false positive rate for our classifier, which was the second one we talked about. Um, in, our, in our testing data, our false positive rate was something like 0.2%, I think, like super, super low, basically zero. Uh, and then in practice, uh, the false positive rate is also probably comparable, but we occasionally see things along the lines of, for example, like other universities contacting us from Eastern Europe or Russia who 
who are using the same exact ISPs uh, and similar sort of signatures to actual attackers. So like it, it always makes sense when there's a false positive and the rate is very low, but they're definitely still there. Um, and I think that's where the human assisted angle sort of comes in to filter those out. I appreciate the answer there. And I'm sure everyone in the channel does. Every, there's a lot of chatter in there. So I will make sure that um, I invite you to so you can either interact or we'll send the questions over. Um, you know, I'm always interested in in people's journey to where they are right right now. And, you know, it, it's no accident um, that, you know, you're here talk, talking about Zeke. And one of the things that people love to hear about is do you have a quick answer, maybe your elevator pitch, either one of you, as to how Zeke became so important? Not, you know, obviously around your, your job, but what kept it there? What, what kept you interested in the Zeke side of things? Well, I, I do have a very long and torturous journey, which I'm not going to bore you with. But um, I guess when I started here in this office, five years ago or so, we didn't really have anything. You know, we had like zero visibility into our network uh, traffic stream across the border. We had a few, we had a handful of, of intrusion detection systems that were, you know, bought from some vendor. And so I think the foundation of all security, regardless of whether it's net security or whatever, is based on visibility. I don't, it's not a secret to anybody here, really. And so the, 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 the value of, of, of the bro, Z, Corelight, whatever logs are the, that it's not just a bunch of alerts without any context. It's a bunch of, you know, it's data. It, and and it's, it's, it's better than packet data, right? I mean, I can always run TCP dump and save tons and tons of packets, but having that summarized, having that be complete and, and available to us is, Key. I mean, that's that's the critical component of our entire operations, really. So, so the fact, so it's it's not raw data, it's not packets, but it is complete data, and um, you know, it's available. We have ninety days of of all TCP connections crossing our border. You know, that's huge. Chase, what about you? What? You know, what kind of holds your interest on, on the Zeke side of things? Yeah, so I only started with all of our working with Zeke like a few months ago, actually. Um, but and, and my background is primarily in statistics, actually, not networking or security. But I guess from a statistical perspective uh, and a data science perspective, it's very nice that the missingness is almost non-existent. Uh, so normally, like cleaning logs, uh, getting them into a workable form would be a huge pain and probably like the majority of the work. Uh, but in my case, um, I came in and I was able to sit down and immediately just start uh, working with the data, which was already very easy to sort of get into a workable form. I was very complete. I didn't have to drop huge amounts of data for any reason. So um, from a statistics perspective, it definitely saves time uh, with probably what's the worst part of the process. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much. I always like to just get little snippets of insight as to how people come and go into this, into the tools that they use, whether it be Z right now or, you know, open source, anything really. So we appreciate you 